Do I need to wait? Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Joan Devine, and I am with the Center for Innovation and uh, a member of the team for the Grow Boulder CFI Conference this year. And we are so pleased to welcome you here today um, to what is the fourth and our final webinar in our Grow Boulder pre-conference webinar series. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping uh, things I'd like to share with you. First, we absolutely welcome interaction. However, attendees will be muted during the session. You're invited to ask questions or share your thoughts through either the Q&A the Q &A or the chat. Um, questions will be addressed at the end of the session. Uh, so if we don't get to it right away, don't panic. We will, we will get there. We are pleased, uh, as this slide shows, to be able to offer CEs. We offer them to nursing home administrator, nurses. We also offer them to certified dementia practitioners. And we are able to provide a certificate of attendance if there is someone who needs uh, something to support hours that they are going to self-report to an accrediting body. Please note that none of the planners or speakers of this activity have any relevant financial relationship to, to disclose excuse me, with any ineligible companies. Um, I just want to mention up front the CE process. You need to be in attendance for the entire webinar and then complete the post-webinar survey that will be provided at the end. Uh, it will pop up on your screen when you leave Zoom. Um, in the general survey, you will be asked to provide your name, indicate which CEs you are requesting, and then enter your license number. And for nursing home administrators, if you have an NAB number, please be sure to provide that, and then we will report directly to NAB for you. Um, for nurses only, um, there is a link at the top of the general session, which will take you to an additional evaluation that's required and must be completed. I, I'm sorry about that, but Michaela's a nurse as well. So uh, as nurses, we know we're the first ones to complain about the paperwork and we're the first ones to add more paperwork to the process. So <laughs> it is what it is. Um, Janet's also going to be placing links in the chat at the, toward the end of the webinar. So as we, and then as we provided in the webinar descriptions, Janet, if you could give us, there we go. Um, these are the objectives um, for the program. Uh, wanted to be sure that everyone knows what they are. And so now let's get to why you're here in the first place, uh, to learn about community innovations when professional becomes personal. I am so pleased to welcome our speaker today, Michaela Gibson. Michaela, along with her sister-in-law, Mandy Shoemaker, are the founders of Prairie Elder Care, an innovative community desi designed to ensure that elders living with dementia have the best opportunities for quality of life through innovative care, compassionate support, and meaningful engagement. So, Michaela, with that said, I'm turning it over to you, and I'm excited to hear your story. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me today. I am, first off, I'm bummed that we couldn't be there for the conference, um, but that wasn't in the cards this year. And also, um, my sister-in-law and co-founder, Mandy Shoemaker, wasn't able to be here today. So, you know, in healthcare, you have to kind of go with the flow a little bit. So that's what we're doing today. Um, so thanks, everyone, for being here and taking the time, because I know you're all busy. Um, so first off, I want to start out and talk a little bit about what is Prairie Elder Care and where did it come from? Uh, Prairie Elder Care started in 2014. Um, but my story um, with senior living and with people living with dementia started a long time prior to that. Um, I grew up where I'm here in Kansas. It's hot here today. Um, I grew up in a little town in north central Kansas um, on a hog farm. And there weren't really many options for jobs for a high schooler. Uh, and so I decided to, rather than work for my dad, I went and got my CNA and went to work at the nursing home in my small town. And let me tell you, that was over 30 years ago. And uh, before there were many regulations and uh, we made a lot of mistakes uh, doing what we thought was the best uh, at that time. And so Fortunately, we have made a lot of improvements, I'd say. We've learned a lot. We still have a long way to go, but um, we have learned some things since then. So um, worked as a CNA, and even though we made a lot of mistakes, I would say we did do a few things right. 
Um, my hometown is 1200 people or was at that time. It's a little smaller now. And most of the people that lived in the nursing home were people that I either knew their grandkids, went to school with their grandkids, or used to go to church with me, or, uh, you know, we had a connection beyond just meeting them in, uh, in that facility. And so I think that helped me at an early age really kind of understand that there is that connection and be able to look past the disease. Um, it was just a general nursing home because they didn't really have specialized memory care at that time. Um, and so um, they, everybody was kind of mixed in together. And um, the thing that really stuck out to me was that even when someone was late in the stages of dementia, that if you were able to take the time and really um, connect with them, that person was still there. And so even though maybe um, it looked like they, you know, were very debilitated, um, you still were able to make a connection, not the same, but it was still there. So that really stuck with me from the beginning. And I think that's what laid, you know, planted that seed um, for kind of where, where we are today. Um, went to nursing school. I'm a nurse, uh, went to nursing school and they kind of teach you if you're an RN, you should be working in the hospital. Like that's the path you should take. So I said, okay, I'll go ahead and try it if that's what, what we're supposed to do. And I worked in a couple different hospital settings and just never felt connected. I never felt like I was able to make that connection beyond what their IV meds were, what their diagnosis was, you know, you didn't get to connect with them on that personal level. And so I did end up um, back in long-term care and did, you know, you kind of get promoted up quickly in the nursing home world. Um, and so the better you are, the farther from the patient you get, the farther from the person you get. And so I, started as a charge nurse, then was house supervisor, then MDS and ADON and RN. And I got to this place where I realized that I didn't really want my boss's job. Like I didn't really know that that was the way that I could make a difference um, with uh, the residents and their quality of life and the staff, you know, like I didn't really feel like maybe that was the way that I could change things. And, you know, when you're in a corporation, you lose the ability to have control over what those um, decisions are as far as financial and, you know, those, that, that realm. So in 2013, my sister-in-law and I decided, let's go out on our own. She was a principal. Um, and so we both had worked with people on different ends of the spectrum, but we both had worked a lot with people and had a lot of experience um, in management. Um, and we both kind of decided we didn't want our boss's job. So we're like, well, let's go ahead and do some consulting. And as we were doing that, we realized that there was a need for something different for people living with dementia and that we felt like the smaller setting was really conducive to being able to provide the best care for someone living with dementia. So in 2014, we opened our first home. We found a um, home in a neighborhood that we purchased and renovated and uh, you know, you kind of add bedrooms and bathrooms wherever you can. And um, ha we did secure it. So um, and we're licensed by the state. So group homes in Kansas, you know, I know it's different based on the state you're in, um, but group homes in Kansas um, are licensed pretty much like an assisted living. And so the regulations are pretty loose as far as what you can do in that setting. Um, and basically, as long as you're able to meet the needs of the resident, um, you, you can provide care to them. So uh, to me, that's a pretty, um, pretty broad. And so we're like, okay, well, let's, let's do this thing. So we opened our first home in July of 2014. Um, eight residents and uh, I made Mandy get her CNA because I knew I couldn't be the only one that worked the night shift. 
And if somebody called in or, you know, on the weekends, um, because we both had small kids and, um, you know, we were very hands-on. And so I think we learned a lot that first year. I worked more night shifts than I ever have before, uh, in that first year. And, uh, it's kind of like giving birth. You kind of like have growing pains and all of that. Um, the other thing that we learned was that the type of connection that you have in that small setting, when you have a small number of staff and residents and families is, um, it's really something that's hard to describe if you haven't ever been in that in that setting. Um, I've worked in big places. I've worked in places with a lot of money and not a lot of money. And there's really nothing to compare it to, I would say. Um, in 2015, we, we filled up our first house um, within a couple months, which is unheard of. I can't, it's, you know, hard to believe that actually happened. Um, and so in 2015, but I'll just tell you, you can't support a family on one, one group home. So, uh, we opened a second one in October of 2015 and that one filled up quickly as well. Um, and again, it was an existing house that we modified and, um, you know, I think you learn what works, what doesn't work. And, um, then we were kind of like, well, what if we built from scratch and what if we were able to design the house and, what really, you know, we kind of started to identify that there is this spe special niche that we have and this special way that we have of delivering care. Um, and so we kind of started to develop what does that actually look like and what, what are the words we can use to identify it. Um, so in 2018, we, um, in 2017, we purchased a piece of land. We purchased five acres. And we um, put together designs to build to build our first two group homes um, from scratch, which was very fun. And, you know, nursing, you don't get to do a lot of like um, a lot of that type of thing. And so it was very fun to build from scratch, to be intentional about how we do it, how we did it and not just work with what the the framework was that we, we had, you know, with an existing house. And so we built the house so that the bedrooms and bathrooms are in the corners of the house. And the center of the house is where the kitchen and the dining room and the living room is. And so that's, um, kind of the heart of the house. And so, um, just by the design, when someone comes out of their room, it's either I'm headed to the bathroom or I'm coming to the common area. And so there's not any of the um, kind of aimless wandering because they don't know like where they're headed. And there's always somebody there that can help them with what they're looking for. Um, or if they're headed to the bathroom can help them get set up for success. Cause we know that there's a lot of trouble that people can get into um, when they're in the bathroom. I see someone has a question about how many persons per home. Um, we now have 10 residents per home um, and with two to three caregivers. So it is um, a nice, and all of our, we don't call them universal workers because uh, that's just um, understood kind of in our setting. Um, everybody that works for us, other than our maintenance guy is a CNA because I feel very strongly about the fact that, um, you know, I've, I have worked in the other setting where there's dietary and housekeeping and nursing and, you know, and it's very compartmentalized and, you know, it's easy to say that's not my job or that's not my hall. And that's not the environment that I wanted to, to have um, for our residents. And so everybody is able to help someone in the restroom if they need it or help them with, um, with eating if they need some assistance there. So, um, that's something that we started from the beginning and I feel like has been a key to our success and also um, carrying on how we want to provide care. Um, the other thing that we do is all of our full-time staff works every other weekend for that continuity of care so that you don't, um, so that everything doesn't fall off on the weekend and then you have a big mess on Monday to clean up. So I think that's another key piece. 
Um, we also don't pay our PRN staff more than our full-time staff because the full-time people are making the commitment that I'm going to show up every other weekend in full-time. And, um, so I just feel like that's really important to, um, have that in place. Um, Uh, the other thing that we implemented during COVID, because, you know, I think for all of us that have been in the business through the um, through the dark time of COVID is that we all like we all experienced some trauma during that time. And so we did change our PTO so that all of our full time staff gets three weeks of PTO a year. And then if you've been with us five years or more, you get four weeks of PTO. So, because I know that that time off is important to recharge and be able to be your best self when you're there. So our group homes have 10 residents apiece. Um, we did open our third group home on the farmstead. So it's on the same piece of land um, in October of 2023. So just, just a little over a year ago. Um, and the, Thing that hap happens in the houses is pretty similar to how you would want things to happen in your household. So we wake naturally. Um, we um, build the menus around what the residents' preferences are. Um, we build activities around what the interests are of the people in the houses. Uh, we also don't move people as... Um, as they change. So what we found is that it's kind of like a family and the, the people that are more able help and kind of um, support more in the house. And, the, and then the people that need more assistance um, are the beneficiaries of those. So, um, and we also see, you know, like it's just like a very supportive environment. And the families are the ones that kind of have to wrap their head around that more so than the residents. So um, someone had asked about why 10 residents and 10 is about the most, in, in my opinion, I feel like if we had more than 10, that it would seem more like a facility and not like a house. So that's why we stuck with that number. Um, a way to add engagement, because engagement is a big part of what we do, is we have a huge community garden. We have goats, pigs, chickens, a miniature sheep, uh, a fishing pond, and just tons of ways to connect um, with the residents, with their surroundings, also with the staff, with their families. And then we also connect a lot with the community, because I think there's that stigma around cognitive impairment because people just don't understand. And so if we make it a place that people want to come and they want to learn and um, want to be a part of, then they take that and they, you know, don't have that stigma of, you know, um, kind of like that is associated with mental health. Um, so our engagement model, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, is to give back community connection and control. And we try to use that for every decision that we make. Like, um, and so I'll go into that more in depth. Um, I, this has really changed how I look at things, um, especially over the last year, um, because my husband was, uh, diagnosed with young onset Alzheimer's last year. Um, I'm 48 and my husband is 57 and I have teenage daughters and I'll just tell you that I never in a million years would have imagined that we would be going through this, uh, at this point. And, um, I thought working in this business for 30 years that I knew a lot. I don't think I'd say I knew it all. I would say I knew a lot. But going through this experience has changed how I look at um, pretty much everything, <laughs> um, especially how, how we take care of not just the person living with dementia, but also the family. You can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, so what have I learned since being impacted personally by dementia? There are about a million things I've learned. Um, some of them, most of them, I wish I never had known, honestly, um, or never had to learn. You know, there are the complexities of the legal side, the financial side. I, we all know how expensive care is. And looking at that when you are also in the midst of college and cars and, you know, raising your kids is, um, you know, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. Um, but I think I'm just trying to figure out what are the ways that I can positively impact how people um, look at dementia and it truly does affect the whole family. And uh, I don't really know how to say that in a way that can communicate um, the losses, um, but I will say that the grieving process starts way before the diagnosis. And most likely I overlooked things or ignored things because I first off thought, what are like, how is it possible that I am working in this business and the age that I am and that this could be my reality. So I think I probably um, overlooked it for a long time. Um, but the losses that I felt, invisible loss. So, you know, a lot of times he's still physically pretty able. Um, a lot of times people will be like, oh, he looks great. Or they'll say hello to him at a soccer game or something. And, um, but there is that invisible loss and loss of what I thought my life would be like. And he, you know, and my kids, all of us thought our lives would be like at this point um, that it's hard to put into words and it, you can't see it. it. It's true. You can't see it, but just being able to be aware of that as, a, you know, people that work in the business and to see that they are going through a lot of things that we maybe aren't able to, you know, we don't, um, there's nothing hands-on to do for it, but it's still there. Um, one thing I listened to, I don't know if, uh, everybody else does too. I listened to, uh, and have read a lot of books by Brene Brown. And one of the things that I saw a clip recently where she talks about empathy versus sympathy and, um, I think about if she described it as, you know, like in the cartoons where there is a hole. And so you're walking along, everything's fine. And then you fall in this, in this hole and uh, sympathy is the person that um, looks down and will say, oh, everything looks okay. So keep up, you know, keep up the good work or whatever. And empathy is the person that gets down there, there with you and is able to actually see you and to maybe be able to say, I don't know what you're feeling right now, but I see that you're in pain. And, um, you know, so I think that's something that us as um, providers, as caregivers need to be aware of and just to be cognizant of. Um, I have been really surprised that um, during this process, you know, I, in Kansas City, I kind of know the right people to go to if you're talking about dementia. And I think that um, I expected people in those positions to be able to, to understand what I was going through a little bit better. And I didn't get that. So, um, you know, trying to look at here, you know, like I'm in this place where I would never choose to be in, um, but what am I going to do with it? And how are we going to make this better for not just me and not just the people that live at Prairie Elder Care, but how can we make it better for, everybody that's going, that's going through this and not necessarily just dementia, you know, like how do we do a better job of taking care of people that are in a hard time? So, okay. I think I'm ready for the next one. Next slide. 
Yeah. So what am I going to do about it? Um, since I, since the diagnosis, I have had a lot of people that have, I've been connected to that, um, have decided, you know, that are in a place where they're just trying to get through it. And I completely understand that. Um, but I feel like I couldn't, I wouldn't be going through this, um, at this point in my life, knowing what I know, if I wasn't supposed to do something more with it. So I think, um, everybody does it the best way they know how to. Um, and, um, anyway, so I think that's, um, just what, how I'm trying to address it is how can I make the system better? How can I make people more, um, able to see, see it from a different perspective and how do I help all of us just take better care of each other? So reimagining dementia care and, um, you know, if you guys are watching this uh, webinar and involved with um, Center for, for Innovation and the Greenhouse Project, I know you guys know this, um, but in senior living, there is a general lack of trust that I see between um, caregivers, families, and, you know, like all the pieces. And I feel like um, that's just been magnified since COVID has happened. So there's frustration on all the sides. Um, and there is a lot of the caregivers or care partners, however you want to call it, um, that are just going through the motions. Like they just want to check the boxes. And I think all of us have days where we would like to do that. You know, like there are days where it's like, can it just be easy today? Can I have an easy day? And um, you know, so I think that's the hard thing is you don't really get to have a day when you're working with humans that are going through a progressive disease where you just get to like kind of be on autopilot. And so I think being aware of that and taking care of each other is really important and being disengaged, um, it is another big piece of it. Um, no teamwork, you know, like I would say that's another thing is it's hard, um, because senior living never stops. So we've been open for over 10 years and we've never been closed a second since then. And it's kind of hard to imagine that, you know, like that we don't ever get to be like, yeah, we're just going to have a long weekend, you know? And so I think all of those things and, um, just the, heaviness of what we do. I think that is um, contributing to some of those feelings of lack of trust and frustration and being disengaged. Um, you know, and I think what we want to strive for is quality engagement, um, proactively meeting needs, uh, knowing people on that personal level, not just on the like surface level, um, being able to connect with them. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and to have the family feel like when they come and visit that things are being taken care of and that they don't have to worry about what's not happening. You know, like they don't have to come in on the defensive to make sure things are happening. Um, and what we really want is everyone to feel like they belong. So we want the residents, of course, to feel like they belong, but we also want the staff and the families and the other people we partner with, everybody to feel like they're welcome here, like they're an important part of the team and that we're all working together. So our defi definitions for community connection and control. Um, control is really what everything in our engagement model is built around. Um, and it's really about offering choice, setting the person up for success, giving them the ability to um, determine, you know, like it doesn't have to be something big. It's just giving them a couple options because um, someone living with dementia can't have unlimited options. But saying, do you want to wear your red shirt or your blue shirt? 
that's something they can still control. Or do you want pancakes or waffles? Like being able to offer choices, we all want to be able to feel like we do have some control. And so however we can give that to them. Um, and I think same thing goes for the um, family member wants to feel like they have some control as well and the staff. And so I think um, one thing that we have recently um, shifted a little bit was to have our physician is a lot more um, part of the team. And so the physician, the family and the staff works together to come, you know, to decide along with the resident as they're able to make decisions on care. And so it is more collaborative and making everybody feel like they have, they have a say, um, and that they have value. So connection is a comforting awareness of a personal relationship, familiar place in the general world around you, feeling that the other person sees you on an intimate level. And I wouldn't say that it's very, very hard to connect. If you don't feel like you're in control, if you feel like you're out of control, you're just in fight or flight mode, you're trying to survive and it's hard for you to connect with anything. And I can relate to this during COVID. Um, I, it was very hard for me to connect with my family. It was hard for me to connect with, you know, like I couldn't pay attention to a book or to enjoy things around me. Um, and I think it was that I was in fight or flight mode. And so I think that's important to know is that if you have, if you don't have that basis, if everything's chaos and people are not having their basic needs met, it's very hard to be able to have engagement, to have that connection. Um, and so if you don't have that in place, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to do that. Community was something that when we initially came up with our engagement model, we had a really hard time defining. Um, and people think of it as things in the community. But really what we're wanting is that common feeling of fellowship, shared values, and being a part of something bigger than yourself, um, having a sense of belonging. And I spoke at a um, I did a presentation on Tuesday, actually, at a local senior living facility um, campus, and they have a committee called the Dem Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee, and um, so and it was called Unity in the Community, and I just really liked that they were making a focus on that inclusivity and belonging. And I think that's really what all of us want, whether we are um, the person living with dementia, the family member, the staff, you know, whoever is that we feel like we're part of something. And that's really what we're trying to create. Next slide. This is just a picture. This is actually from our very first house of two of our residents. Um, neither one of them were really uh, had lost a lot of their verbal abilities, um, but they're looking at a book, reading poetry to each other, and they're connecting and communicating, even though the words may not line up. But I just think it's a it's always been one of them that really stuck with me. So. So how do we create community connection and control? Let's start with uh, control on the next slide. Like I mentioned earlier, control is the foundation of our engagement model. Um, some ways that we, we give back control um, are having um, family meetings where we talk about what's coming up. We ask for their feedback, even though it is sometimes, you know, like it's sometimes painful to hear that. Um, and also with staff too. And it's just so important um, that you have that two-way conversation. Cause I know a lot of times um, it's very tempting, especially when you're really busy and you're really, you know, just to direct as the care giver or care partner, um, in a facility and it is important to hear that feedback and, um, that goes for, for residents, families, and for, for the other staff. 
Um, I think, you know, what are some ways that the traditional care model takes away control? I mean, I think there are so many ways that we set it up, you know, doing care this way is much less efficient of time and money and all of that. But I think we need to look at how would we want to be taken care of? How would we want to um, live our senior, you know, later years? And so um, being able to have choice, being able to decide what your day looks like and how you are treated. I think that's just, you know, that's a basic human need. So the components of control, um, proactively meeting needs. I think one of the biggest things that we do well is keeping consistent staff in the houses. So whether um, the way that we do our staffing, there's always a full-time person on the weekend because that's when things, you know, first off, that's when a lot of families come um, and that's when things kind of fall apart. So we always have a, a full-time person on the weekends that knows what to expect because if you proactively meet their needs, you know, people talk about um, behaviors and really, I, you know, a lot of people say that, but what it really is, is an unmet need. And sometimes it's hard to know what it is, but if you know that person, you um, know what to anticipate and you know in the afternoon that they get tired, staff might think, oh, they need um, something for anxiety, but really they just need a nap or they're overstimulated or whatever it is. Um, I think the other components are of control is the home design home design. And so um, how we set up the house so that you're not wandering around, that you're not just aimlessly um, walking. And so if you come out, you either see the bathroom or you see the kitchen. And so it cuts down on um, choices. Purposeful activities. I think purposeful activities are huge. And so all of us have things that we are good at that are come to us naturally. And so identifying those things so that we can um, set them up for success. Each of our residents has their like kind of list of chores. And so um, whether it's setting the table or folding clothes or emptying the dishwasher, you know, those little things, gathering eggs, uh, you know, all of those things that, really help to give them a sense of purpose and kind of a little reset when things are hard. And simple choices, I think is what it says behind there. And I think that's pretty simple, honestly, you know, give them choice, but don't give them a million choices because that can be overwhelming. So this is Matt. He, this was our garden before our third house was built. But anyway, I just always have thought I have liked this one. This was just after he moved in and um, he was very physically able to do things. And so he would come and he would water um, tomatoes for, for hours. And that was just a way that he felt he was a helper and a doer. And that was a way that he could take care of us. Um, and feel like he was had a purpose. So I think I talked touched on this earlier, but when people feel like they're in control, then they're able to connect. So um, let's talk about the different types of connections um, that can happen after someone feels in control. All right. So the important parts of connection are um, after that person has um, feels like they're in control, they have their needs met, they feel like that safety, really, um, they're able to connect. And um, it's really a lot about building trust, which is seeing the same person over and over and feeling safe with that person. Um having that shared experience in the moment, this is really where the farm animals come in handy. So, um, you know, if, if it's hard, the words are hard being outside and 
watching the goats or feeding the pigs or our chickens are actually pretty hilarious. And so we'll let them out in the yard and they, I mean, they're not going anywhere because they got a really good gig at Prairie Elder Care. And so, um, you know, and gathering eggs, like those are all things that we may not have anything, you know, in common, but in that moment, that's kind of a cool thing and we're doing it together. And so you can kind of connect through that, even though you might not have, you know, that previous connection. Um, also accessing those past connections. So things that, that are important to them um, in the past. We had a guy who was very, um, he was a, cha- he was, he was a pistol. Let's just say that. And um, one of the things that he had done, he did a lot of duck hunting and he had a duck call. And so even very late in his disease process, he would be able to do all these like intricate duck calls and it might've annoyed a few people, but I thought it was pretty cool for him to be able to connect to something um, that obviously was very special to him, um, even late in his disease. Here's a, a few of our residents. You can't see that they all have a um, noodle that they are rolling. So they are connecting with themselves, really. And so they're doing an exercise class and they're rolling their um feet on it. And so they're like engaging their core, they're doing some balance there. Um, but you can see all of them are very much focused in, um, different levels of dementia, different stages of dementia. I am a trainer for Tipa snow, so we could go down a whole different path there, but I know we don't have time. Um, but they're all engaging in their own way and, um, connecting with themselves actually, which I think is really important because I think sometimes they have a hard time with that. So All right, so how do connections create a feeling of community and foster engagement? Um, one of the th- my favorite things that we have done at Prairie Elder Care for since the beginning, the first year we um, hosted a Thanksgiving dinner on Thanksgiving, um, which that's how you knew that we were new is because we um, gave up our own Thanksgiving. Uh, so we got a little smarter. We did it like a couple days before Thanksgiving. And, um, but I think it was our third year we had like 80 people. So we had eight residents per house at that time. Um, and it was, it's always the time of year, I guess, because it's about being thankful Thanksgiving. Uh, I don't really even like Thanksgiving food, honestly, but something about it, is I usually feel overwhelmed because it is just the way that you can um, see those connections, see this community that we have built, um, that they have built, you know, and um, really at this point, it's not about me or Mandy anymore. It's about these, you know, we have these amazing uh, caregivers that, um, take care of these people like they would their family. We have managers that all like do the, do the things they need to do. And then we have these residents and families that just have this, we have this community supported by volunteers. And um, I think Thanksgiving and the holidays are just times where it, you can see it, you know, it happens every day. You can see life happening on the farmstead, but it really is, just very special and something that, um, you know, that we do want to find ways that we can expand it beyond um, just, just the farmstead. So, okay, I'm ready. 
Um, so how have we created community at Prairie Elder Care? Uh, you can see this is looks like some Girl Scouts that we have here. You can see behind a little bit is our fishing pond and then the red barn and the animals are back there in the community garden. So we really have volunteers through churches and our school system and just people that have heard about us through really word of mouth. That's the only way we've marketed and our Facebook page, which you see what's happening. Um, but people see what we're doing and they want to continue to, to support it and be part of it. So beyond our farmstead, another way that we can help people outside of just the people that live there is our day program. Um, it is one of the two freestanding day programs in Kansas. I know people are from all over, but um, there are not a lot of freestanding day programs in the state of Kansas, at least. Um, and so it's open Monday through Friday, nine to three. We have it as a very social type uh, situation where um, people feel some of them think they're coming to volunteer. Some of them think they're coming to work, you know, that type of thing. But most of them just feel like they're coming to see their friends and they come and are engaged for the whole day. We do art therapy, music, art therapy, music therapy, um, exercise. We do balance. We do um, things to just hit all different parts of your brain. And um you know, I think they feel like it's a place that's safe, that they don't have to worry about if they say the wrong thing. The thing that I would say that I wish was different is that I wish people came earlier because I think that's what is missing. I think people are still trying to do it on their own for too long and then not taking, um, advantage of these type of programs, which is really, it's a huge benefit for the person living with dementia because they're busy and they're engaged and then they hopefully sleep well that night. Um, but it's also a huge benefit for people that um, are the caregiver. It's a respite. They can go to Target. They can go get their hair done, like whatever they need to do to fill their cup, because that's, that's what's going to keep them going longer if that's their goal. So you can head to the next slide there. Uh, we did identify that there are a lot of people that want to, um, that are needing something before the day program. And so when a year ago, when I started to um, realize that I was going to have to figure out some of these things sooner than I um, ever would have guessed, um, we identified that there is a lot of things that can be done on the farm. And so for some people that are, aren't able to work, but need to have something to feel useful and have a purpose. And um, we started our work program. And so they're paired with a volunteer um, we have, we work with Rockhurst University, which is a local college and their occupational therapy students set up a work plan for them. Um, and then every 12 weeks we review it and we see, is this everything still working? Are we on the right track? Do we need to modify things so that it's just another layer of free support that they have so that the caregiver can have a little break and um, they can keep them home longer or just, you know, have a better quality of life for both individuals. The next thing that we're starting is um, our community center. Uh, this is the basement was where we have our day program. And then the upstairs, we've always had office space and we don't really use our office very much because we're busy in the houses. And so we're starting, uh, November is national caregiver month. And so, um, next month we have our first like, um, group meeting where we are inviting people to talk about what are the challenges that they're having. Um, 
we've offered a support group for years, um, but there's something they, there's more to it than just a monthly support group. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, doing something on Zoom is just being in the same room with someone, it's much easier to connect. And so um, our goal is to hear what they are saying, like what they feel like they need. Do they need help with dementia, understanding dementia? Do they need help with how do I get through the next day? Do they need help with legal or financial or, um, you know, what, what are the challenge home modifications? So what are the challenges that they're seeing? Cause I don't want to assume that they're having the same challenges that I am, but I do know that there's, there's a need out there. Um, so based around that, we're going to, um, build our plan for, for 2025. The other thing is the social gatherings is just getting together with people. And I think that's huge. And, um, You know, I know from my perspective, there are times that you feel like people kind of look the other way uh, because they don't know what to say. They don't know how to approach it. And I just want to make sure that people understand that even though this is a big part of what I'm going through right now, that there's still more to me. Like I'm a nurse, I'm a mom. I, you know, like there's more like, I don't know. I'm kind of funny sometimes, I think, you know, and so just being able to remember who you are um, and have other people be able to do that too, uh, I think is really important. So I hope that this helped, um, helped everybody to maybe think about what how you could implement um, some of this in in your settings um, and support your people living with dementia and caregivers. Uh, I saw some questions, but it was too, I got too distracted trying to to look at the questions and then um, keep going, so. Well, it just so happens I've been following the questions, Michaela, so. I I figured somebody (laughs) was, I was hoping somebody was doing that job. Before we bounce to the questions, I just want to say, so nobody misses this, you are truly incredible. And I've seen some comments um, in the app about that as well. What you have done, you, you, it just seems so natural to you. But I think we all know <laughs> none of what you have done has been easy. Yeah, um, I did have my tissues here. So <laughs> I am glad I was able to pull it off. So, well. Let me go through some of the questions. One was the fishing pond. Is that a big liability Mm -hmm. for you? You know, so our homes are secured. Um, It was the city actually required us to do it because we had a drainage ditch. So we had to do something. So that's kind of how we how we roll. Like, let's stock it with some fish and make it fun. Um, I mean, what isn't a liability? Honestly, it's senior (laughs) living and people living with dementia. So, uh, you know, like whenever, whenever um, the residents are out, we have staff or families with them. So. Well, thank you for your courage for supporting that. You know, one of Pioneer Network's values is that risk taking is a normal part of life and. Uh, thank you for allowing. Having animals is a risk. We know that. Uh, yeah. Somebody asked that question. Uh, if you have, do you have residents that come from urban settings, and are they comfortable with all the animals? And who takes care of the animals? Does the staff have to help with them, or or how does that work? Right. Uh, yeah, that's a good. I didn't even touch on that. So the pig lived at my house for a month when we got him. He was five pounds, and he slept in front of the fireplace. Um, And then now he's just a regular pig. So, um, but we do have, uh, we have a master gardener that um, takes care of the the garden primarily. And then actually, I didn't even talk about this, but my husband, Jim, helps with the gardening and the animals. Um, And so it's been a great way for him to find purpose and feel, um, like he's contributing. And so the animals love Jim, but you know, and so he, he does chores most days. Um, but then we do have some backup. So, 
Um, and there is, we have a house that's kind of the non-animal house, I would say. And that's okay too. Like, um, I can, I can relate, you know, I get that. So personal choice. Um, here's a, a technical about how, what is about the square footage of your homes? Uh, I can send an email. I mean, I'll send an email with it. I don't know that number off the top and, of my head. And we can get you the, the questions from the chat. So yeah, can, that'd be great. Um, I wasn't ready for that question. There you go. <laughs> Bethany asked the question. Pigs I was ready for. So, but yeah. <laughs> how did you get your provider? Uh, the physician, is that a contract employee or how, what, how is that arrangement? Uh, he is actually, we actually switched, um, recently and he is my doctor and Jim's doctor and just had a, has a heart for what, how we do things. Um, and I think it's just really what your expectation is of your medical director or what your, you know, so, um, but they, when they come and do rounds, they send, a progress note to us and then they send an update to the family too and like communication is kind of a triangle so um so everybody so nobody feels like they aren't in the loop is is the goal so Wonderful. we all know there's families that have a lot of dynamics <laughs> and that you know but really? we try to, yeah I don't I don't maybe, think anybody else maybe is just us, that, so yeah <laughs> A couple of questions on funding. Um, how did you get some of the initial funding as well as do you accept Medicare, Medicaid, public, public aid? Right. So we're licenses uh, home plus, which is like assisted living. Um, we're private pay and we um, take long-term care insurance. Um, in the beginning, I, you know, like put, took a loan out on my house. So like, <laughs> It was a, it was all in. So it was, um, yeah. You're a courageous woman. And yeah, risk I mean no that question. risk taking, I'm all, I'm all for that. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, somebody asked a question. Do you run three shifts? We do a hybrid actually. We do a 12 and an eight so that there isn't everybody leaving or coming at the same time. Um, Cause I feel like that in the afternoon, you know, that kind of can, um, increase some of that anxiety later in the day. So we do, we do a hybrid. Okay. Uh, what are the hours of the work program? The work program is nine to 1130. So it is just a good amount of time, you know, like it's hard work. And so if you haven't been working physically, they're usually pooped by the time it's over. So <laughs> Um, we're looking at, we actually do a partnership with a local elementary school. So we're looking at for the winter, because it does get cold here, um, some opportunities that they could do some, you know, do some things in the schools that like we do a like um, reading program. So, um, which is just the coolest thing ever, but just ways that we could take it inside for the winter. So sounds like you have some incredible partnerships. We do. Yeah. And then let's see, two more questions. Um, one was the levels of care. So you are assisted living. We are licensed like assisted living. So we do a flat rate and then we do charge extra if you um, require two people to transfer. So if it takes two people to move from one surface to another, um, and if you need to be um, help with meals for 100 percent of the meal, and then if there is any like if more than an hour a day of one on one. So but I don't like, you know, like for one thing, it's more paperwork to have to have all the levels of care. And I don't like paperwork. But the other thing is, I think it's important for people to know what they're getting into because it's not cheap, you know, and. I don't want someone to come in expecting to pay five grand a month and they're paying 10, you know, so. Well, thank you. And that was the last question. And we, we are out of time, sadly. But first of all, I just want to thank you so much for sharing 
your story, which is a very personal story, it the is, courage yeah. that you and Mandy uh, have shown in creating this world for some very special people and following your passion and really making a difference. We, as we have said, we know that's not easy, but we thank you for doing it. We thank you for sharing it. Um, we truly, another example of, of if life could just be as what you want it to be, we would have small houses for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, or something very special for each person, and you found a way to have that for the people that you serve. Um, the this session, just some logistics. This session uh, has been recorded, and it will be, as was noted in the uh, in the chat, it will be on the conference page. If you go to, uh, and I put a link to that. If you go to the conference information on the website, if you go on the agenda under Monday, November eleventh at two p.m., it really won't happen at that time. But you can go there and you can find the recording for both for this webinar as well as the other ones that we have had. We just want to give you a little bit of what comes next uh, up here on the screen. You see, this is uh, leading through lifelong learning and growth. It's the next in the uh, Elevate Elder Care series. Uh, it's a podcast with Freeman. Grabowski, I hope I said that right. He is the former president of UMBC and a lifelong learner who shares his stories of fighting seg segregation and picking up new skills and hobbies at all ages. So that should be, go to the website and check that out. We're hopeful that some of you uh, on this webinar are already planning on joining us in November 11th, 11th through 13th at the CFI conference, Grow Boulder. Um, it is going to be just an incredible experience. We truly, we know that there'll be lots of learning, networking, and some fun along the way. Um, the uh, There's going to be great general sessions, pre-conference workshops, the selection of concurrent sessions. There is truly something for everyone. Uh, and also, if you see uh, here, there'll be a great opportunity to get CEs. For those of you who are needing those, if you're going to get CEs, you might as well do it in a great way. And then we invite you uh, to check out the conference, go to the registration page, uh, go to the website page and see how it is. For those of you who are coming to the conference, are registered, Michaela is on the app um, and I believe Mandy is too. Um, so while you won't be able to see them in person, you can chat with them and network with them through the app. Um, so again, I just want to close by uh, thanking Michaela so much. And please tell Mandy, thank you, because I know her heart was here, even if she was yes. not physically yes, with us. This is an incredible story that you shared with us. Um, and we wish you and your family, your big family, um, all the best in the future. And for those of you who came and joined us today, we know how precious your time is as well. So thank you for being here uh, to be part of this experience. And we hope to see you along the way, whether it's in Grand Rapids or on, on a Zoom call sometime. Uh, we, hope to, we hope to connect further with you. So everyone have a wonderful day and thank you. Thank you. One minute for all of you who just asked me for the nursing home. The, oh, the survey for the nursing home administrators will pop up at the end. As soon as I close the webinar, there'll be a pop-up that'll come up and you can answer the survey right there. Thank you, Janet. <laughs>